Following on from my Arrested for Violent Behaviour video, I wanted to talk about a byproduct of censorship, and this occurs when an establishment hates a film so much that they actively try to stamp it out of existence. In doing so, they attract even more attention to the thing that they wanted no one to see, and as a result, people want to watch it when they might not have in the first place. It's only because they made such a song and dance about it. This is known as the Streisand Effect. No, I was going to make a joke about it being related to Barbara Streisand, but I don't have to do that because it's actually true. How is it true, Patrick? Well, let me tell you. Thank you. So, in 2005, there was a photographer whose job it was to document the Californian coastline. And Barbara Streisand threw a fit and sued him because he included her Malibu beach house in his series of photographs. And she sued him for like, what do, what do I have written down here? I think she sued him for like $10 million because she claimed that it allowed people to see all the different points that they could access her house if someone wanted to rob her or break in. Now in the week that this news broke, the photograph of her home was viewed over 400,000 times online. Beforehand, six times. Twice by her lawyers. The point is, no one cares where a celebrity lives or what their house looks like, but they do care why they're so angry all of a sudden. In short, the Streisand effect is a name given to the opposite effect that aggressive suppression of information produces. Just look at Life of Brian, a religious satire accused of blasphemy. On top of being condemned by the Catholic Church, the film was banned in several countries, including Ireland and Norway. In order to make the most of the situation, the marketing team behind the film used the Streisand effect to their advantage. The tagline on the Swedish posters read, So funny they banned it in Norway. They banned it? How is it that funny? Let's go find out. Despite 39 UK county councils banning the film outright, Life of Brian was the country's fourth highest grossing release of 1979 and the number one British film in the US. See how it works? He wasn't the messiah. He was a very naughty boy. The Da Vinci Code caused a load of commotion when it opened in 2006. The Vatican called for Christians to boycott the film, describing it as being full of lies, offences and historical theological errors. Basically saying that it's a load of shite and not to be listening to that sort of thing. The Peruvian Episcopal Conference, which is an event where all the bishops of Peru get together and chat about all things church, they took it a little bit more seriously than others, declaring the movie a systematic attack on the Catholic Church, and that if someone goes to see the movie, they are giving money to those who hurt the faith. It's not a problem of fiction. If the truth is not respected, what arises we could call white glove terrorism. Terrorism. <laughs> Ron Howard and Tom Hanks are responsible for an act of terrorism. So how did the world respond to this blasphemous, dangerous piece of terrorism? The film opened with a 224 million worldwide weekend, the second highest ever at the time, just behind Star Wars Episode 3. 758 million, okay? 758. Remember okay. that number, 758. Okay, 756, 786. 758, 758. Five, six, seven, eight. Will you stop? As it turns out, branding a film as the end of days does wonders, far more than any marketing team could hope to achieve, because the film went on to earn 758 million worldwide. Now, I'm lucky I got that. <laughs> and it seems as if the church learned from the mistake they made with Da Vinci Code. When Angels and Demons released a few years later, there were no calls for a boycott, nor was it labelled a terrorist act. In fact, it was given a semi-positive review by a Vatican newspaper, calling it harmless fun that shouldn't be taken too seriously. Hold on, it's not an abomination that drags the name of the Lord through the mud? Where's the excitement in that? Ah, I'll give it a skip. <laughs> Angels and Demons took 468 million worldwide, a drop of almost 300. And by the time Inferno came out, nobody cared. The church or audiences, so it took 220 million. What this illustrates is that if you hate a film, you wish it never existed and would be happy if you owned the last unfortunate pair of eyes to have been assaulted by watching it, then you shouldn't say a word to anyone. Just stop talking about it. What they don't know won't end up in their DVD player. Following his fiery review of Wolves at the Door, detailing his detest for the film, critic Mark Kermode released an accompanying video explaining that he will never discuss the film again, because the sooner it fades from memory, the better. And I'd like to say that it's directed by John R. Leonetti, written by Gary Doberman and or Dauberman, and produced by Walt Homada, Hans Ritter, and Peter Safran, all of who, whose names deserve to live on in ignominy for having anything to do with this vile piece of trash. Can you see? 
When Reservoir Dogs burst on the scene in 1992, the VHS release was delayed until 1995 in the UK and Ireland due to the controversy surrounding it. Rather than be bothered by this, Quentin Tarantino was delighted to see that it had a successful run as a re-release in theatres, stating that the easiest way to kill the excitement and cult of something is to make it readily accessible. The Reservoir Dogs. Hey Joe, I'm gonna shoot this guy. But there are a few cases where the condemnation of a film defies the Streisand effect where the attempt to eradicate its possible audience proves successful. However, the necessary action to achieve this takes things too far, into the realms of distaste and irresponsibility. This is perhaps most true in the case of Martin Scorsese's Last Temptation of Christ. In response to the film being accepted into the 1988 Venice Film Festival, Jesus of Nazareth director Franco Zeffirelli removed his film Young Tuscanini from the programme, an obvious protest highlighting his objections towards the film. As it turns out, his Jesus of Nazareth miniseries was also accused of being blasphemous by several religious groups, so it appears you can't do anything right when it comes to pairing Christ with a camera. In October of the same year, a Catholic extremist group set fire to the Parisian St. Michael Theatre just for showing the film, injuring 13 innocent people, four of which were severely burned. Similar attacks against theatres included graffiti, assaulting film goers, and setting off tear gas canisters in the middle of screenings. This madness was not strictly confined to Europe, however, as the American release of the film proved to be equally outrageous. Christian groups chose to boycott and protest the film, including picketing outside the headquarters of Universal Studios' then-parent company MCA. Lord, I hope this is what you want. One protester dressed up as MCA's chairman Len Wasserman and pretended to drive nails through the hands of his buddy dressed as Jesus onto a wooden cross. Evangelist Bill Bright offered to buy the film's negative from Universal just so he could destroy it, ensuring no one could ever view it again. The most ironic thing of all is that most of these people hadn't even seen the film. They just didn't like the idea of it. And that was enough reason for them. The protests were effective in convincing several cinema chains not to screen the film, among them was General Cinemas, who later apologised to Scorsese for surrendering to the antics of gobshites. Did he actually say gobshite? No, I did. If you thought the Peruvian bishop's reaction to the Da Vinci Code was excessive, wait till you get a load of Mother Angelica and what she had to say about Willem Dafoe in a toga. Denouncing the film as founder of the Eternal World Television Network, Angelica claimed it to be the most blasphemous ridicule of the Eucharist that's ever been perpetrated in this world. Adding the subtitle, a Holocaust movie that has the power to destroy souls eternally. And I mean, Jesus, they should have put that on the DVD cover. If I made a film and somebody said, this film has the power to destroy your soul forever, I'd be like, fuck, I'd buy that. On top of scaring cinema chains out of screening the film, the VHS and Laserdisc sales were also stifled due to the fact that most video rental stores, including Blockbuster, declined to carry it out of fear that a bum dressed as the Angel Gabriel would start throwing bricks through their windows. Now, having just watched the film recently, I came up with my own ideas to why it was so controversial. And then I looked at the special features and I saw that Martin Scorsese has the exact same opinion himself. So if you want to have a more detailed suggestion as to why this film was so problematic for Christian groups, just listen to what he has to say on the bonus features of the Blu-ray. This is what I got from it. In the Bible, God is being described, or Jesus is being described, as being a man both human and divine and when you look at paintings or when you look at classic film representations he's got porcelain white skin he's flawless his hair is perfect and he always knew exactly what to do jesus was never being depicted in a state of crisis so that's very much the divine aspect and you get that in this film you get the divine aspects when he's turning water into wine you get the divine aspects when he's resurrecting Lazarus from the dead. But you also get it in more smaller, subtle moments, like when he's able to pacify an angry mob, or something elegant like drawing a perfect circle in the sand. But what this film chooses to focus on is not the divine, but the human side. He has flaws, he has wants, he has needs, and he's being pulled in so many different directions that he needs to choose one, but he can't, because it's too difficult a choice to make. You think it's a blessing to know what God wants? I'll tell you what he wants. He wants to push me over. He wants to have a sexual relationship with Mary Magdalene. He wants to have children. He wants to be happy. That's what he wants in life, but his responsibilities are greater than that. They're more important than that. 
And I think that's, that was that was it. That's all they have. There's nothing else that I can see in this film that's offensive or that is disrespectful. They just didn't like the idea that Jesus wasn't this perfect soul, or at least the character of Jesus. So congratulations to all involved. The Last Temptation of Christ was a commercial failure, despite the critical praise. The hateful, over-the-top behaviour ensured that much. But we know better now that we've seen this happen twice. North Korea acted the same way over the interview. I spent a lot of time with Kim and I think he's not a bad guy. When something like this happens, we are left with two possible explanations. Either general audiences actively ignored a film which insulted their faith, or simply avoided putting themselves in the firing line of unhinged Bible bashers. My bet is that it probably wasn't the Martin Scorsese film, but what do I know?